Welcome to Torah Foundation in Yeshua. This is part two of the two priesthoods. Um, if you haven't watched part one, obviously, you please, 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 you got to watch part one because we're going right into it, right where we left off. And two, um, this is kind of part of a, of, of a kind of series um, that includes the first video being a covenant made new and the second one being understand the sacrifices which really those two should be listened to or watched and studied out a bit before getting into these um the part one and then into this second part of the two priesthoods so without further ado let's get right to it we left off in part one we're kind of doing a going through the book of hebrews and we finally got into chapter seven which was starting to kind of get into the into the main purpose of the book of Hebrews. So we're going to continue right off. We just left off with chapter 7, but we're going to skip. Right now we're going to skip chapters 8 and 9, and we're going to go to chapters 10 right now, and we'll come back to um, 8 and 9 in just a moment. So with uh, chapter 10, let's read the first four verses of the book of Hebrews. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they continue, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then they would not have ceased. For for then would they not have ceased to have been offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had uh, no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So because, because that these uh, offerings that the Levitical priests, the sons of Aaron, offered by Torah, the instructions of Yah given through Moses, they could not remove sin or make one perfect. If these offerings could have, they wouldn't have had to have been offered over and over, year after year. As we previously covered in understanding the sacrifice teaching, the blood of bulls and goats could only atone for the flesh for that precise uh, point in time where it, when it was offered. Um, and that was all they were ever meant to do. The sin nature or the sin consciousness within man still remained. And it's important to realize that that's all they were ever meant to do. For some reason, there's this belief out there that... Um, that their sins, that sins was removed by this, the blood of bulls and goats during the, during that time period of the, uh, the temple period, you know, before Yeshua came and what have you. Um, that's not what it says. And that's why it's so important that you don't establish your doctrines on scriptures taken out of the Rit HaDashad or the New Testament without knowing the foundation without understanding what the Levitical priesthood, what, what all that was about, what the sacrifice, the sacrificial system, what that was all about. That's why we started, you know, talking about the covenant and then getting back to the sacrifices, what's that all about, to lay this all out. So when we get to this point, we do have an understanding, knowing, you know, when we read this, that the bloods of bulls and goats could not take away sins. We're like, oh yeah, because that's not what it was meant to do. It was never meant to take away sins. It was meant to be an atonement or a covering so that one could draw near to Yah in the temple or the tabernacle. That's simple. I mean, it was obviously a foreshadow pointing to things and um, and what have you. But we is one who's a true student of Yah, of the Word of Yah, of the Word of God, um, you've got to study it. You can't latch on to these man-made doctrines. You know, everything that you hear a man say, you've got to find it in the scripture. And sure, they'll take a scripture out of the New Testament and get this big old long teaching on it. But your question should be like, okay, well, where does that come from? You know, you know, Paul said all scripture, all scripture is for reproof and correction. There was no Brit Hadashad. There was no New Testament. You know, there might have been at some point around there, there might have been some Gospels floating around, but there wasn't much. When he said Scripture, he was referring to the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And it tells the whole story. So you got to understand it so you don't... I'm, I'm going another tangent. <laughs> You've got to understand the foundation 
either that or you've built another building that is not the correct building. It's a false doctrine. It's a false paradigm. The paradigm is the foundation of the Old Testament, of the Torah, of the books of Moses, the prophets. That is the foundation where all scripture should be interpreted and understood. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. So let's continue on. And we're in chapter 10. Let's continue on with verses 5 through 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrificings for sin, you had no pleasure. Um, then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire or had no pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua Messiah once and for all. Okay, we got a lot to unpack right here, so let's get to this. First, let's look at the phrase, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Okay, one should not misunderstand what this means, but interpret it according to the purposes of the blood of bulls and goats, as we were just talking about. Um, when you read in the, um, in the Torah, in Leviticus, when it talks about the sacrifices, it talks about this burnt offering, which is an ascending offering. As it goes up, it says it's in a pleasing aroma to Yah. And I and we talked. When did I? I think I talked about it in the understanding the sacrifices. So I don't want to get too much into this. But does that mean that oh yeah, Yah just loves the smell of burning meat? I mean, we're not even talking about cooking meat. We're talking about burning meat. And it's like no. What what he what was a pleasing to him is that the obedience that his people would have in the process and the rituals that were needed for them to come to him. So it wasn't that he really was taking pleasure in, in all this blood. It's, it's not that at all. It wasn't that at all. So, so we have to interpret it to what the purpose of the blood of bulls and goats are. Like I said, this is, this is covered great in the understanding sacrifice teaching, like I just said. So to understand that the blood of animals never could or never would remove sin, but was only to draw near to Yah's presence in the tabernacle or temple. Yah's greatest desire is to completely remove sin and the consciousness of it. This is how we understand what is being said here. It is saying that in the volume of the book, it is written of me. It is stating that, that all of it is a type and shadow of Messiah. It all points to Yeshua. And remember, what Yeshua did was for eternal matters. And I'm expanding on that a little bit more. I mean, if you guys have noticed on, our, on the YouTube channel, that's my verse. That in the volume of this book, it's all written of me. The whole scripture is about Yeshua. It's about the redemption of all things, the plan that Yah put in place to bring it all the way back to Eden. Man with him in the garden, no consciousness, no knowledge of good and evil, no knowledge of sin, no remembrance of it. I mean, that's where it gets to at the very end. And we talked about that greatly in the... In the um, covenant made new teaching and i think we hit a little bit on it in here too and so to to understand what this is is it, everything is pointing towards yeshua you know even though things are required for things to be done at a certain point in time it is always pointing to yeshua it's always pointing to the greater it doesn't do away with what's being happened now but it always points to the greater the greater being the restoration of all things. The cross was not the end-all be-all like Christianity seems to want to teach so much. The cross was just the first step of Messiah. That was just the first step. What was the first step? That his blood had to be shed. He had to be the suffering servant. Why, why did he have to be the suffering servant? To pay for our penalty of transgression of the law. He didn't come to remove the law. He didn't fulfill the law so we don't have to be obedient. He came, lived the law perfectly in corrupt flesh, 
so that he was the spotless lamb. Because, well, you know, like I said, everything's about him. The Passover lamb. The blood applied to the doorposts. That's what he came to do, is to take our penalty so we could go into that door. And we'll talk about that more at the end of this. But, but um, it all points to Yeshua. It all points to him. Um, and it's all about the eternal matters. The eternal matters are always the greater. And that's what this is what's being trying to... That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews, is trying to say, here's this, and here's this. This is for this, but this is for this, and it's the greater matter. It's not doing away with this, because this will keep on going until this, until this ends. I'm getting way ahead of myself. But it's, it's, it's pointing about what is what and what is the greater matter. Um, the next part we'll address is the phrase, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. This is another place where much doctrine is created by missing what is being said. Some will say this is referring to with Shua doing away with the Levitical priesthood and replacing it with the Melchizedek priesthood, which we already talked about that. Or even the, the old covenant with the new covenant. And we covered that in great detail in the first teaching. That's not... I said... It's not precisely what it's talking about. Yes, it alludes to that, but what it's talking about, um, the, the, it's the timing that we're talking about, that there is a change. I mean, I know so many say, oh, nothing, it doesn't change, it doesn't change. Well, Yeshua said, until heaven and earth pass away, in Matthew 5, not one jot or tittle the law will be you know, done away with or abolished until heaven and earth pass away. What is that point where heaven and earth passes away? That's what we're getting at here. We talked about it in great detail in A Covenant Made New. It's this present age and the age to come. Okay, so um, let me see. I got off my notes again here. What's being referred to by saying first and second is much bigger than just a single thing. It's all of it, like I said. The first is referring to this present age and all that's within it. The second is the age to come, which is eternity, and begins with the new heavens and the new earth. We covered how scripture teaches these two ages extensively in a, in a covenant made new teaching. This is extremely important in understanding what really any of this, whether it be the covenant, the sacrifices, or the priesthood. So I, I keep on going off on my notes and, and trying to make this point, but, but, but it, it's necessary that... We understand this timing. You know, we, we talked about it in, in, in the uh, um, the covenant teaching, the uh, covenant made new teaching, of when is this second established? When is this renewed covenant or new covenant established? Christianity says, you know, if you accept Yeshua, you're in the new covenant. Well, no, you're not. Because we went through the definition. We went through line by line by line the 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 um Descriptions, the word I was trying to say, description of what the new covenant is. And it hasn't happened yet. The new covenant is the age to come. And when is it at? It's at the end of this present age, after the millennial reign. And that's a hard concept for a lot of people to grasp. And that's why I really recommend, you know, going through all these teachings before you get to this point, because you'll be like, wait, what? What? And we do cover it in detail in uh, the covenant made new um, teachings. So at the end of the present age, the first, okay, at the end of this present age, the first to go into the second, the age to come. What Yeshua did as our high priest is for the eternal, the age to come. And we will come back to this and keep talking about this over and over throughout the this rest the rest of this teaching. Let's continue on in Hebrews chapter 10 and let's read verses 11 through 14. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly repeated, repeatedly <laughs> the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. We've we've established that. But this man, capital M, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of Yah from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified okay now here we go again we got a lot to unpack here but first 
let's keep this top let's keep to the topic of the priesthood it is again repeated that the ministry of the levites the ministry of the levites done day after day could never take away or remove sins but yeshua offered his blood once and for all then sat down now that's huge this means he only had to minister as high priest one time forever. Did, did you get that? His, his ministry as a high priest isn't an ongoing thing. These people try to teach that, 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 this, that him being a high priest is being the high priest over the Melchizedek priesthood, and we're priests in the Melchizedek priesthood. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But he only had to minister as high priest and, and the, the job of the priest, remember I talked about this earlier, the job of the priests were to minister, to minister in the temple, in the tabernacle. And theirs was the application of the blood, the handling of the blood. He only had to do that one time. The high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, year after year after year. He only had to enter the heavenly temple, and we'll get into that more. He only had to enter into the heavenly temple one time and then he sat down his job as a high priest was over okay so this isn't an ongoing priesthood that requires offerings over and over again he applied his blood in the heavenly tabernacle and sat down waiting till all his enemies are made his footstool so what does that mean and i know i think we covered this in one of the other teachings too if i'm not mistaken but let's, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 24 through 28. I think it was in the Covenant Made New teaching that we talked about this. But, but um, anyways, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Then comes the end, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. I'm talking about Yeshua, he gives the kingdom back to the Father. When he, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Remember what it said? He was set down at the right hand of the Father till all enemies were made his footstool. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are, are under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is expected. Now when all things are made subject to him then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that Yah may be all in all. Okay? So let's, let's, let's look at this a little bit. So we see the final enemy is death. After all else has been put under his feet or made his footstool, then it's death's turn. This is explained how it happens following the millennial reign or in the messianic era in Revelation. And let's go to Revelation, the 20th chapter, and... Uh, we're going to read verses uh, 7 through 15. Okay, now when, uh, when the thousand years has expired, the end of the millennial reign, remember Satan was chained and thrown into the, uh, the, the pit at the beginning of the millennial reign, right after Yeshua had returned. Okay, so after the thousand years has expired, Satan will be released. Oh, also let's back up. Remember the beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire too. So, okay, so so they're already gone. The beast and the false prophet, they're already gone forever. They're in the lake of fire. Satan will be released from his prison and will go out and deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sands of the sea. They, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So they all surrounded Jerusalem. This is the end of the millennial reign. And fire came down uh, from God out of heaven and devoured them. So, bam, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before it even really got started, it was over. You know, that, that, that was that was the end of that. Um, uh, let's see where we're at. So the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. I already said that they already are. And they will be tormented, tor tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, so now Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and, all's, and all whose face... The, uh, the earth and the heaven fled away. Let's see. Let me make sure I said that right. I say, okay, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose the face of the earth and the heaven fled away. So basically, the corrupt heaven and earth couldn't even 
see this the majesticness of which I which I picture it being you know God the Father. I mean, I picture the veil being split open because the veil still the veil still is there during the millennial reign. Yeshua's presence is there, but the veil between and the, the dimensions, I guess you could say, the dimensional veil between the fleshly realm and the spiritual realm, it's 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 still there. That veil still exists at this point. And I believe at that point, that's when that veil's ripped open, and there there we see Yah, the great white throne. I mean, this, I may change my mind on this. <laughs> that's where I'm at today as I'm making this video. Um, okay, it says, uh, it says, and there was found no place for them. Talking about the, the heaven and earth, the, the corrupt heaven, the heaven corrupt heaven the corrupt earth there was no more no more place for him i mean this corruption it's it's gotta go okay and i saw the dead small and great standing before god all books were open and another book was open which is the book of life and all the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books the sea gave up the dead and all that were in it and death and hades or sheol delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged one each according to his works Okay, so this is the final judgment. This is, this is it. This is it. Okay, so after that, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone who was not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. So at this point, at this point, evil in every form, every fashion, ceases to exist. It's all cast into the lake of fire. All those who rejected Yah death itself is cast in the lake of fire so that's what it's saying after all enemies are made his footstool that that's why the cross is not the end all be all because the restoration of all things is not complete the 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 end all be all is at this point when all of death is cast up into into the lake of fire this is where we get to the point now that we're at the end of this present age okay um Let's see where I'm going with this since I get off my notes. So first, Satan is cast in the lake of fire. And after the great white throne judgment, death, shoal, and all those not found in the book of life are cast in the lake of fire. This ends this present age. All enemies are defeated and the reign is given back to the Father. And we'll talk more about this in a moment. And there, there's a really neat thing. I, I, one of these days I might get into the teaching about the reign being given back to the Father and, and how... I kind of picture that in my mind, what that actually means. But, but, but all we need to understand is, is Messiah's purpose was for the restoration of all things, beginning with the suffering servant and ending with the conquering king. Until all things are conquered, all things are made under his feet, then his job is done. The job of Messiah is done at that point. And that's why the reign is given back to the Father. So let's go back to Hebrews and read. I want to read the chapter, we're in chapter 10. I want to read verse 14 again. For by one offering he has perfected forever all those who are being sanctified. It says by Yeshua's once and for all offering that Yeshua's once and for all offering perfected perfects us. And we'll explain that shortly, but notice it says those who are being sanctified. Not are sanctified, but being sanctified. That's extremely important to understand. Sanctified means being made set apart or holy. What is it that defines what is set apart? What is set apart? What is holy? Only Yah can declare what is holy and set apart. That's what the Torah is for. So for us to be going through this process of being set apart requires us to know what we are being set apart from. The Torah is Yah's instructions, His commandments. And that gives us, the, that, that's where we get that information. As David said in Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. The, that word is the Torah. That's why it's still in full force, not in any way done away with. These passages cannot be understood in their proper context on the writer's intent if one thinks the Torah no longer applies. So, so we'll get back to the eighth let's 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 see where oh yeah we're going back to the eighth chapter now of hebrews we skipped over and we're going to come back to it and we did that for a reason because where we left off with the seventh flowed into the tenth of, of the point that you know of how i was trying to make this in the order 
So now let's go back to Hebrews 8. And we're only going to cover a little bit in this because a big chunk... Well, I probably say that, so maybe I should just read. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one... Yeshua also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make things, all things, according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, talking about Yeshua, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant. Now we need to be careful how that's said, because it's not a different covenant. It's, he's a mediator of the renewal of the covenant, which was established on better promises. What are those better promises? Eternity. Eternal promises. Okay? So here we see Yeshua ministered as high priest in heaven. His blood was applied in the heavenly tabernacle for eternal purposes. He could not have served as a priest here on earth because he was not a Levite. And people say, well, God can do whatever he wants. But he has to do what he establishes in his word because if he doesn't, the integrity of who he is crumbles. When he says... This is how it is. When Yah sets out a plan, basically what Yah does is he puts, we don't put him in a box. He puts himself in a box under the rules and commandments he created. And he said, this is forever. This is how it has to be. So for him to say that Levi, the sons of Aaron are the priests. You are the handlers of blood on earth that Yeshua could not be. But it didn't need to be on earth. It wasn't about being on earth. He was, he was not born in the flesh of a Levite. He was born from the tribe of Judah in the kingly line, which he does serve as a king on earth. He also had no need to act as a priest on earth because his blood was not for the flesh, but for the eternal. I, ho I hope you're all starting to get this because I get excited about this. You know, once, I, once you see scripture and it starts popping out at you, it's like... Man, it's exciting. The rest of chapter 8 deals with the renewed covenant, and we covered that extensively in the teaching, A Covenant Made New. So please go back and listen to it if you're not understanding how that ties in. It's an important part of this whole series, but I'm not going to cover it again. So please go back to it if you need to. I mean, I do. I go through, we go through the, that part of Hebrews chapter 8 several times, reading it over and over, going through it, breaking it down. As I think I said earlier, getting the description of what the new or renewed covenant is, how the Bible defines it, not man, how the Bible defines it, so we can get this right, so we can walk in Yah's ways the way he said, not what man said. So let's move on to chapter 9 of Hebrews. In this chapter, we see how Yeshua's duties as a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle is in context with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that's... That, that's Oh man, that's, oh yeah. Okay, so let's start with chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the, and uh, the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, the most holy place which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, which were, the, which were um, in, which, in which were the golden pot that had the manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat, or lid. I don't like that word seat. That's not a good translation. It wasn't a seat. It's a lid. Um... Of those things we cannot speak. Of those things we cannot now speak in detail. Okay, so let's look at this. We see the use of the word first here, and it is tied to the earthly set apart or holy place, as pre uh, as previously covered. That this refers to this present age. The most holy place or the holy of holies refers to a shadow of the age to come. Okay, that's interesting. 
that even the tabernacle and the way it's laid out is representing the two ages. And um, um, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail. I'm really feeling like, I'm really, it's really been, I feel like it's on my heart that that's going to be the teaching that we'll probably do around Passover this year, breaking down the tabernacle and what everything means because it ties right in with this. And But seeing that the first part, the holy, the holy place represents this age and then the um, the most holy place is the age to come. So this will cover in more detail in a future teaching. Now in the most holy place, we see the golden censer. A lot of people get hung up on that because they're not understanding what that means. It is only inside the most holy place one time a year, and that is on Yom Kippur, or I should say Kippurim, like I said before, the Day of Atonements. That is how we know what the context of what's being said here at this point in chapter 9. So that's important. That's really important. Okay, so let's continue on with verse 6, and we're going to read through 10. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin, committed in ignorance, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices were offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regards to the conscious concerned only with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Okay, let me get a drink here. Okay, it is made clear that the earthly ministry, especially the high priest on the Day of Atonement, was symbolic for this present age and does nothing for the sin conscious but only for the fleshly things until the time of reformation or, as other translations say, when all matters are set straight. Okay, so as we previously talked about, all matters are not made straight until all enemies are under Yeshua's feet. And that's why we skipped over to do that before we read this, because we had to make sure that was understood. That is clearly at the end of this present age, after the millennial reign, and the great white throne judgment when death shall and all whose name is not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. So the timing. And remember when I first talked about the book of Hebrews, the biggest problem that we read is we get the tenses wrong. People think this happened here and not here. You know, they, they read it and they think that it's talking about a present tense or a past tense. You know, looking back at the work at the cross, because you got to remember this was after the time of Yeshua. But everything's talking about a future tense. And this is, you know, what do we say? 30, 40 years after Yeshua's death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. So, and it's still talking about a future tense. Okay, so we saw in the teaching, understanding the sacrifices, and here in verse 9 and 10, that the earthly priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, is in place until the time of reformation, when matters are set straight. Did you get that? The Levitical priesthood is in place until the time of Reformation. That's what it said. The fleshly, indoor, indoor, fleshly ordinance is imposed until the time of Reformation, when matters are set straight. Yeshua did not replace or do away with the Levitical priesthood. As we've covered in previous teachings, the Levitical priesthood will be in full operation during the millennial reign. If you don't understand this, please go back to the previous teachings on the covenant and the sacrifices to get caught up on exactly what we're saying. Okay, so let's continue on with verses, uh, where are we at? 11 through 14. But Messiah came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer and the sprinkling 
and sprinkling the unclean sanctifies and purifies the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to Yah, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, so now we're getting to the whole point of the book of Hebrews. The purpose for the earthly Levitical priesthood and the purpose of Yeshua as our high priest in the heavenly priesthood. That's the priesthood, not Melchizedek. It's the heavenly priesthood. The Levites, or more specifically, the sons of Aaron, were instructed how to use the bloods of bulls and goats to purify the flesh to come near to Yah's presence in the tabernacle or temple. Because it was only a covering or atonement for the flesh and didn't remove sins, there still remained there was so sin still remained so the process was repeated over and over we've been saying that many times over in this teaching but the blood of yeshua is applied to the most holy place in the heavenly tabernacle once and for all for eternal redemption it will completely remove our sin consciousness when at the end of the age the complete knowledge of sin and evil will be gone with remembrance of it forever. And that's what it says in Revelation. I should have put the, do I have a, I don't think I put it in here. I think we put it in the covenant teaching, but, but there'll be no remembrance. It'll be completely wiped. No knowledge whatsoever. You know, and it, it talks about it too in, in Isaiah that it's gone. The, the, the knowledge of evil is gone. Okay. And that's what, that's what this allows us to. Our choice Man, I'm going to get in so many rabbit trails. Our choice to follow him gives us him, gives gives Yah the legal, and I, I, I use that word loosely, but I use it to also really make a point. It gives him the right legally to completely remove that from our thoughts, from our minds. You know, those who choose, don't choose to follow him, they're going to face the second death in the lake of fire to be gone forever. It won't, it won't, it won't, it'll be gone. It'll, it'll be gone. Because in the new heaven and new earth, there will be no remembrance, no knowledge of evil whatsoever. And Yah had to make it that way. I, I really ought to do a whole teaching on this. Yah had to make it that way so that we chose him in the worst of times. We chose him in corrupt flesh with temptation and sin all around us. We choose him him to legally give him the right to remove it from us he can't if he just removes it from us we didn't do that on our own will you get what i'm saying anyways let's let's continue on i, I could go off on so many different rabbit trails this stuff is so good um we're okay we're in hebrews 19 hebrews 19 hebrews 9 and we're gonna start with verse 19 through 22 for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the book of the covenant which Yah has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood, uh, with blood the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things were purified with blood, Okay, and here we go. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Okay, we're going to talk about this one a little bit here. So in the last verse there, in verse 22, the last part says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Uh, I think most translations say there is no forgiveness. And this can cause some confusion to those who study Torah, because in Torah, if you couldn't afford an animal for sacrifice, you could bring a grain offering. And, and even those who know Yeshua, Yeshua forgave sins without any bloodshed. So it kind of looks like a contradiction. But I say it's not a contradiction, it's a translational issue. Let's look at it. The word in Greek is aphesis, which means to... Uh, release from bondage or imprisonment now it does mean forgiveness or pardon of sins and remission of the penalty but here's the key when we cross-reference this with the hebrew 
you get the word Shemitah, the Shemitah, which means to release from debt. Deuteronomy 15, verse 1, at the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. In this passage, you see the Shemitah, the release of debts. Okay, keep, keep following me here. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 16 through 19. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and his cust as, as, as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery to the sight of blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So we see, so we see um, to proclaim, to set, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Some translations say to proclaim liberty to captives or to release. This is the Greek word aphesis. So Yeshua is talking about a Shemitah, which is directly linked to the Jubilee. Let's go to Leviticus 25 and let's read verses 8 through 10. Keep following me here. And you shall count seven Sabbaths, of years for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years that shall be forty nine years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the tenth month, on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. Okay, so we see that the jubilee is declared on the Day of Atonement, or Day of Atonement, it's Yom Kippurim. And it is made clear in chapter 9 of Hebrews that that is what the writer is explaining, or what he is explaining is in, a Day of Atonement's context. So to understand the use of the Greek word aphases in Hebrews uh, uh, Hebrews 9.22, it should read, without the shedding of blood, there is no jubilee or release of debt. Okay, so that is much different than just forgiveness alone, in that forgiveness is just a pardon, where there, whereas a release completely removes it. And um, sometimes we don't really think, we don't really understand that in our Western mindset. But just to forgive somebody is, you know, okay, I forgive you. But to completely release the debt, to remove it as though it never was, to take it back. What it means, what it basically means is to take it back as it was before. What, what do we talk about? What is the plan of the restoration of all things, what it is to take it back to the way it was at Eden. So without the shedding of blood, there is no jubilee. There is no release of debt. And that's huge to understand in that aspect. Um, to, to, get, to get the point of why, what Yeshua's blood was truly doing. It wasn't just a forgiveness. He forgave sins before he even spilled a drop of blood. It's not about forgiveness. It's about the complete release, the complete removal of sin consciousness. Okay, let's uh, let's see. So, see, I think I missed a part here. So that's that's what makes Yeshua's blood and his role of high priest superior to the earthly Levitical system. A complete different and much higher purpose. Okay, let's keep moving on. Hebrews 9, we're in the 23rd verse, and we're going to read up through 28. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Messiah has not entered the holy place made with hands, 
which are copies of the true, but in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Yah for us. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood, uh, with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And, he, and it is appointed for men once to die, but after this judgment. So Messiah was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So, man, so, I mean, do you start to see how clearly once you chop away all this leaven and doctrines of man away from this and, and get the tenses straight and understand the wording in, in the book of Hebrews of how clear this is and how far off we've allowed our belief systems to get, that it is really just so simple. So just as the blood had to be applied in the earthly tabernacle, the same had to be done in the heavenly tabernacle, but the difference being once and for all. It was a one-time deal for Yeshua because it's for the complete removal of sins and consciousness of it forever, not to re 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 ugh, repeat it, okay? So that's how we got to here. So now we're, we're jumping back up to Hebrews 10. The uh, Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, to enter the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of Yah, let us draw near with a true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience that our bodies are washed with pure water. So the holiest, the holiest that we enter is not the most holiest place in the earthly temple or tabernacle. Once again, that would be against Torah. Only the high priest can do that. This points to the greater. The greater being the age to come, eternity. It is only by the blood of Yeshua that we enter eternal redemption okay so yeshua is our high priest and the first fruits of the resurrection so we're gonna kind of think we're <laughs> gonna kind of try to wrap this thing down but let, let's go here um okay so yeshua is our high priest and the first fruits of the resurrection we made that clear he's also likened to moses let's go back and read deuteronomy 1818 I will raise up from them a prophet like you he's talking this is Yah talking to Moses I will raise up for them a prophet like you from amongst their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak them all that I command him so Moses and Yeshua spoke the word of Yah with Yeshua actually being the physical manifestation of that word <laughs> and both of them taught righteousness and right rulings. So what are the main duties of a priest? Now this is a priest, not a priesthood. Let's not get the two confused. What are the main duties of a priest? To act as a mediator between the people and Yah to teach Yah's instructions and right rulings. Okay? So we see, we see Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and also two of David's sons are also called priests. So how could that be? Let's uh, read Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, and then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So now... All of Israel is, is being called a kingdom of priests. So what does all this mean? <laughs> Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5 and 8. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act accordingly to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. 
For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? And the Lord our God is to us. For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as in all this law which I have set before you this day? So what Yah was doing is he was establishing that Israel were to be mediators, priests, between Yah and the rest of the nations. They were to shine light to the nations, the light of Torah. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Oh, I mean, I might run out of water here. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5. Uh, verses 14 through 16. You are a light to the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Israel failed greatly on this and actually broke the covenant. So is there a time that this will all be fulfilled? Yes, there is. Isaiah, the ninth chapter. Let's read verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom... To order it and to establish it, it will judge and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, so we know this is referring to Yeshua. Notice it says the increase of his government, or uh, I think some translations say rule. So keep that in mind. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7. I know I'm going fast through this, but this is, this is good. Daniel 7, verses 17 and 18 those great beasts, which, which are four, are four kingdoms which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Now let's jump down to verses 21 and 22. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So when Yeshua returns and judgment or right rulings are made in favor of the saints, the time will come to possess the kingdom. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I know we're going through this quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Dare, dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law, go, go to... Go to law before unrighteous and do not go before saints. In other words, if you're having odd against your brother, are you going to the courts of the nations or the courts of the unrighteous and still have settled in the matters within the brethren? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, you are unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So the point being is the saints, which is us, will judge the world. And 2 Timothy 2.12, if you endure, or if we endure, you shall also reign with him. And if we deny him, he will also deny us. So we will reign with him and judge with his authority. Let's go to Revelations 2.26. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I give power over the nations. And let's see, where are we at? Um, Revelation 3.21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, stick with me here. Let's go to Revelation 20, and let's read verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Yeshua, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast in his image, and had not received the mark on the his mark on their foreheads or on their right hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. Over such, 
The second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. Okay, so clearly those who are, well, let me, let me see what I say there. So clearly we will be reigning with him and be priests if we're part of the first resurrection. So what does this mean? We'll be priests. Let's go to, <laughs> I know this is a, a, an ongoing circle. I hope you're following me through all this. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2 and read verses 2 through 5. Now it, shall, it shall, now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above all the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. This is talking about a millennial reign context. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain to the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall come forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Okay. I think we really are starting to wrap this up. Kind of. Um, in the kingdom, the righteous who are reigning with Yeshua will be sending forth the light of Torah to the nations. That's the light within us. The wisdom that Jethro revealed to Moses was this model of the kingdom. That's what we saw with David's sons as they were helping with his rule by bringing judgment to the people. 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who have obtained mercy, who who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Okay, this is the royal priesthood, a king of a priest or mediators of Yah's word, his Torah to the nations. Just a quick side note, the last part, it says a chose, uh, uh, or no, wait, I got a couple notes here. Let's see, which one am I going with? A uh, quick note, it says a chosen race. Then, oh yeah, then he clarifies who this race is by the last part quoting from Hosea, which he said, you who weren't, who were, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. That's straight out of Hosea, which means it includes the 10 tribes scattered into the nations along with Judah, all of which have accepted Messiah. If you don't understand this, please see our teaching Jews, Gentiles, and Israel in the Torah Foundation series. Um, so the whole point there was to show this calling is not a priesthood in the sense of what we see the Levites, the sons of Aaron, were appointed to do with the handling of blood for the purification of flesh, and also with Yeshua being high priest, applying his own blood for eternal matters. Okay? Many try to say the royal priesthood is the Melchizedek priesthood, but there is no passage in scripture that says this. Not one. And I, I challenge you to find that passage. It is not there. So I really wish people would stop teaching that. It is not in there. Yeshua being our high priest was to apply his blood once and for all in heaven for us to enter into the coming age or eternity. The phrase Melchizedek priesthood does not appear in scripture anywhere. That is man twisting it to say what they want it to say. As we previously pointed out, the scripture says Yeshua is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, meaning according to the decree or cause of Melchizedek. In no way does it make it a priesthood or a priesthood that is according to Melchizedek. Okay, let's see here. It's also a great fallacy to say we are priests in the Melchizedek priesthood. Yeshua is a priesthood. Yeshua is a high priest. Sorry, I got that wrong. Yeshua is a high priest of the heavenly priesthood, and it doesn't and can't operate, operate on earth according to Torah, and that is made clear in the book of Hebrews as we've covered, and also back 
in in uh, Exodus and Leviticus talking about the Levites. So how can one believe we can operate in this so-called priesthood on earth if our high priest can't? I mean, think about it. You know, it makes it it makes sense, no sense. It's just adding to scripture and misunderstanding what this royal priesthood is, and that's what we just and that's what we also just covered. Yeshua operates in the heavenly priesthood, where the ministry or application of his blood was done in the heavenly tabernacle. He did not enter the most holy place in the temple on earth, as we covered that administration by Yah's command was and is only for the Levites, the sons of Aaron. Yeshua's blood is for eternal matters, not for corrupt flesh. That flesh will die. Only incorruptible flesh enters in eternity, the age to come. His blood is for the eternal to remove sin consciousness and not a band-aid for corrupt flesh that will die. Our flesh will be changed or raised up in the resurrection. The true biblical definition of being born again. But, that's another teaching. I'm not going to get off on it. So, in another words, Yeshua's blood didn't come to replace or change the Levitical system. As we have shown in scripture, the, the Levitical priesthood, along with the animal sacrifices, will be in full swing during the millennial reign when Yeshua will be ruling from Mount Zion, the temple in Jerusalem. The belief that Yeshua replaced the Levitical system, or he was the fulfillment of these animal sacrifices, must be abandoned. Ask yourself this, was Yeshua an acceptable animal as described in Torah? Now let's not get confused there, because we do talk about him being without spot and blemish as the Passover lamb. No, that's, a, that's symbolic. But as far as the blood of bulls and goats daily, was he an animal as described in Torah? Now here's the next question. Was he slaughtered by his throat being slit and was a priest catching his blood in a basin? Was his blood sprinkled on the altar, then on the ark of the most holy place? Was his body burnt on the, on the altar after that? This would all have had to been the case by Yah's Torah, his instructions, if Yeshua was a sacrifice that replaced the Levitical system. And yet, this is the belief that is accepted in most of Christianity, completely disregarding what Scripture teaches. Yah's word is eternal. It's best not to believe contrary to it, following man's ideas and philosophies. So let's, we know what Yeshua's blood was for a greater, greater purpose. It's separate. His blood is not for corrupt flesh. His blood is for eternal redemption. So I hope we've made it clear throughout these teachings on the covenant, the sacrifices, and the priesthoods, that to understand the context and timing of these things is to understand the two ages and how the scriptures define them. To understand what, what is, uh, to understand what is for what age, whether this present earthly age or the age to come, which is eternity. A simple way to see it is that redemption is for us to pass on into eternity. It does nothing for us in this present age. All we know of this age will be destroyed. Heaven and earth will be made new and corrupt flesh will be changed into incorruptible. Flesh and blood as we know it cannot inherit the kingdom of Yah. Only the incorruptible will. So are you starting to see and understand how this all ties together? The new or renewed covenant, the resurrection, and the complete removal of sin consciousness are all eternal matters, and that is what the blood of Yeshua is for. He first had to take our guilt upon himself and pay our debt to provide us with that jubilee, that liberty or release from the death penalty that we all deserved. This is the only way to have life. To have that life is to cross over to the age to come, into eternity. You see, Yeshua truly is the door. And to be with the Father face to face is life. To have that, there can be no death, no sin, no consciousness or remembrance of it in any way. 
It's really that simple. And all these man-made doctrines that muddy the, the clear waters that leads us to life are nothing more than ploys of Satan, of Satan's deception to fool those who haven't really truly presented their bodies as a living sacrifice, that is, to crucify their flesh and only follow the Messiah. When he said, no one gets to the Father except by me, that's exactly what he meant. Yeshua the word of the Father made flesh is the plan of restoration of all things. He is the doorway to life, to eternity. So I hope these teachings help to understand all that the Messiah did and how it's applied and how all he has done provides the doorway for that age to come. And I hope you all are enjoying these teachings. We'll continue on it here soon with the talking about the tabernacle and the temple in a few months here. Anyways, y'all bless and thank you.